team, and it will be one of my take-home messages, is that it, it, it's a teamwork. Uh, if uh, you wish, you can push the button. Next slide. Can you advance? Is there anyone advancing the slides? Yeah, great. So my disclosures, I have no financial relationships, uh, but uh, I'm the vice president of the ERS and it's a great honor to share my experience with you. And at the bottom, you see some of my colleagues uh, uh, urging you to stay at home, stay at home, don't go out. Next slide. Next. All right. So the content of my talk will be very simple. Previous slide. Uh, it is uh, to describe briefly, previous slide, to describe briefly the pandemics of uh, COVID, and then I will give you some personal uh, opinion and some uh, recommendations. Uh, I would like to have the previous slides, please. Two slides before. It's advancing without asking. Two slides before, please. No. All right. Advance now. One. OK. Stop. All right. So you can see here the uh, clusters in my country. Previous slide, please. It's impossible. Huh? If I could have the first one. Please, you, you have two, two more before. Back two. No, back. If the technician could go three slides back, it would be great. If not, I'm going to, to present without my slides and uh, I will just describe. So uh, currently in France, we have a few major clusters. One in the east part of the country where everything started and one in Paris and one in the north of Paris. These are the three major clusters. And currently in the great Paris region, we have more than 13,000 current COVID-19 hospitalizations. Then uh, if you uh, analyze critical care, yeah, that's great. If, if you can share that, that will be fine. Okay, so one more, yeah. So these are the clusters, you can see them very well around Paris in the middle. And uh, here you can see that uh, similar to the clusters, uh, you have the critical care uh, patients with more than 2,600 patients with COVID-19 hospitalized in critical care right now in the great Paris region. And you can see the death number with more than 3,500 uh, patients dead in the great Paris region since 1st of March. So on the next slide, if you wish, uh, you will see what happened uh, in terms of sharp increase of hospitalization. This is exactly that. We always say that there was a very abrupt, very sudden increase in hospitalizations due to severe COVID cases. And you can see the brown, the brown line indicates the number of hospitalizations in my uh, hospital network. And you see until 12th or 13th of March, there were not many. And then out of a sudden, there were lots of hospitalization, not only in my hospitals, but also in the region in blue. And you see how sharp it is uh, surging to more than 6,000 hospitalization. The next slide uh, shows you uh, in parallel the sharp increase in COVID hospitalization in critical care, critical care 
uh, departments. That's the next, yeah, that's exactly this one. And you can see uh, in green in my hospital network and in blue in the region, uh, we had to multiply by more than three the possibilities to admit people in intensive care units within days. And I think that's a major threat to uh, our hospital system. So now I'm going to, to focus on the next slide on the greatest challenges and recommendations I can make. And uh, that's the next slide. And the very first thing I wanted to share with you is that you have to be organized. And uh, the organization is very important. I can see uh, Dr. Nava on the screen, and he's a close colleague and friend, and he works with other friends like Sergio Avari. And I must say that they warned us. They warned us. People from Northern Italy warned us, as we do it now to other people. And my colleagues from the east part of France, they warned us too. Uh, we were warned of the real threat. And in response to that threat, we had to secure a COVID-dedicated wing in the department overnight on Saturday 14th of March when we first saw the first cases coming to the ER emergency room in the department we decided to secure a COVID wing in the department and we emptied the rest of the department as Dr. Seledon said uh, we are an expert center on pulmonary hypertension and we had to say to everybody to go out and we dedicated the whole department to exclusive COVID care. And in the uh, network of hospitals in which I work, we had to multiply by more than three the number of ICU beds within 10 days. And we currently have 2,783 beds. We had also to close the research labs not involved in COVID research, and we hide all the MDs and residents uh, in the department and all the engineers, technicians, staff were hired for all the duties uh, dedicated to COVID. A second very important thing in terms of organization, you have to protect yourself, your colleagues, your staff, your relatives, and your patients. And this is critical. Uh, in areas where they were not ready, you had up to 30% of uh, uh, there is a problem here. We have uh, up to 30% of uh, uh, healthcare providers who get infected. You need to have masks right now, protections. You need to train your staff. You need to stop external visits. You need psychological support to your patients, but also to your staff. Uh, you have to increase the number of staff. You need volunteers because you will have, even if you do your best, you will have some sick colleagues. And you have to uh, protect non-COVID patients uh, with acute and chronic disease, with non-COVID areas in the hospitals, but you have to be careful with that. You have to externalize the non-COVID care as much as possible, and you have to use technology for internet or telephone-based clinics and follow-up. On the next slide, and it will be nearly the end, uh, I would like to insist on the next slide on uh, care, research, and triage. Uh, if you could advance one slide, please, yes. Uh, so in terms of triage, you have a major role of chest imaging. Uh, CT is better than chest X-ray. I know it's not always possible to do CT to all patients, but that's what we do. And in terms of PCR, uh, be aware that there is a delay. There is no point of care available yet in my country. And there are lots of false negatives. When you have an obvious uh, COVID with a negative PCR, it is a COVID. In terms of care, you have to hospitalize in COVID plus areas with dedicated teams. You need oxygen, you need anticoagulation. You have a lot of media pressure for unapproved therapies such as hydroxychloroquine. And this is not acceptable, I think. In ICU, Dr. Nava and others will uh, will discuss that later on, but uh, you have lots of uh, high technology, uh, of course, high flow oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, intubation, prone position. We will discuss that later. Complications occur, and I would like to emphasize a lot venous thrombolytic disease. It is very common in these patients, and you have to be aware of systemic involvement with cardiac, renal, and liver uh, disease. In terms of research, uh, we are, of course, doctors with a great interest in research, and we have done a lot of research 
in the last couple of weeks. We have established cohorts, we have established randomized control trials, as you did in your countries, but this is necessary. It's better to have data than to have feelings. Next slide. Uh, I just wanted to share with you uh, on the next slide uh, something we have developed with our friends and colleagues from the Flashner Society. Uh, we have developed several scenarios for triage in ER before admission. And because you know we don't have a point of care COVID test, we go straight on the right to imaging. And imaging in my hospital is the tool of choice for medical triage. Next slide uh, is, uh, in fact, my conclusion slide. On the next slide first, and this is the job we do today, you need to improve awareness. Thanks, uh, Stefano and my colleagues from Italy and the east part of France. Be aware, it will come. It will come, and it's a disaster when you are not ready. Do not wait for action. It's a teamwork. Protect yourself protect everybody. Triage is a major issue. Many complications, including VTE, collaborative research, and don't forget the non-COVID patients. And my last slide is a thank you slide. You have seen that I have put a lot of drawings in my talk uh, from the kids of my colleagues and the kids from patients. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for organizing this very important webinar today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Humbert, for your nice presentation. Uh, we will leave the questions at the end yes. of, this, uh, of this webinar. And it is the time to introduce the following speaker, Dr. Stefano Nava, who is full professor of respiratory and critical care at the University of Bologna. And I would also add uh, one of the leaders of the Italian School of pulmonologists and intensivists with uh, high expertise in, in ventilation. So please, Dr. Nava, your uh, perspective from Italy. I think okay, it's needed to, to, to switch thank you Leda, thank you, uh, they, to this microphone. I am now I should be not muted. C can you hear me now? You can. Okay, perfect. So, thank you once more, Eva. Yes. Thank you, uh, Juan Carlos, and thank to all the others, ERS, ATS. I have to say that I share 100% uh, of what Mark uh, uh, said a while ago about the organization. Uh, Next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, I have no conflict of interest for this presentation. Obviously, next. Well, okay. Uh, I did not arrange this uh, slide with. Uh, I, 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 one second. I'm sorry. Maybe you upload. can I upload my slide directly because maybe it's easier for me uh, to show the screen because I, I'm not sure that you upload the right slides here. Can I up, can you show my screen, please? So I think. I saw it. Can you see now? Can you see it or we not? We can see it, but not, it, we can see a screen, I, I, but not in a I presentation. You as I, mode, how come? Okay, here, here you can you see it or not now? Can Dr. you see? Nava, we can see it.
You can or can't. Yes, you we can, can see it. Just can't. put it for can. me, please. We can. Yes. We do see this live. You need to explain this live. Okay. So you can put in a presentation. Okay, so, okay, so I... I put it in a presentation. How can I? Okay. You, you can't see it, eh? Um, let me request, um, Stefano, we can, can see, see the now. You can move on if you want. Okay, you can see. Eva, can, can you, you can see it or not? Move on. Yes. Yes, please, we can move on. Oh, so I have no conflict of interest. Okay, from this presentation. Everything started on February 21st in Codonio, in North part of Italy, not very uh, far from Milan, and these are the four main clusters that we have right now in Italy. Uh, one is in uh, Lombardia, the other one is in Veneto on the right hand side, the other one is in uh, Piedmont in the left hand side, and finally where I work, uh, uh, the yellow one in Emilia Romagna. Well, uh, uh, up to yesterday, because I still do not have the data of today, 156,000 Italian tested positive, included myself, and uh, almost 20,000 people, 20,000 Italians died of COVID. Um, now, one of the main questions is how do you face a pandemic? And one of the critical points is the number of critical care beds that you may have uh, in uh, our continent, I mean in Europe. This is a slide uh, of the number of a critical care bed for 100,000 people. As you can clearly see from the slide, Germany is by far leading the number of critical care beds. Almost 300 beds out of 100,000 uh, inhabitants. However, Italy is not doing so bad. It's uh, more or less similar to France, um, and is around 12.5 beds uh, for 100,000 people. Uh, for example, UK and Spain uh, are actually doing much worse than uh, France and Italy they do. However, these beds, as we will see, were not absolutely enough to face uh, these devastating pandemics. Well, here, uh, there is another way to see uh, how is the impact of the pandemic? And uh, this uh, uh, index is called impact on hospital capacity. What is this index for? The number of coronavirus cases per critical care bed in each country. The higher is the number, the higher is the burden of the disease uh, on each bed. And once more, you see that Italy and Spain are doing uh, worse, especially compare once more to uh, Germany. Then last, uh, uh, let's say, theoretical slide. And this is uh, another way to see, uh, as, as for the John Hopkins University Eurostat uh, paper, uh, the number of cases of coronavirus per 1,000 hospital beds in each country. Uh, Italy is once more leading, uh, we got, uh, let's say, 350 beds occupied right now in Italy out of 1,000 hospital beds for patients with coronavirus. So this is just to say how big, how huge was the burden in our country of the disease. Now, I report you some uh, data. This is the first probably report from the Lombardy region. I took Lombardy as example as marked it from the Great Paris area. These are data collected from February 21st 
through March 18. Here you can clearly see that 1,600 patients were admitted in this uh, less than four weeks in uh, uh, the ICU of Lombardia, north part of Italy. The mortality rate was extremely high. 24% of patients, they died in the ICU. As you can see, most of these people were affected by comorbidities, as expected by cardiovascular disease, uh, hypertension, uh, COPD, diabetes, malignancy, and most of, most, if not all these patients were mechanically ventilated. Only 12 of them were ventilated non-invasively, but we may come back to this issue uh, uh, later on. Now, the most interesting thing is we describe in the JAMA paper only those patients admitted to the ICU. I remember 1,600. Well, the interesting thing is that almost 9,000 people were admitted in these three and a half weeks in Lombardia. And therefore, my question is, what happened to the other 6,500 people admitted to the hospital? First of all, all of them were affected by respiratory failure. So, as a pulmonologist, more than densities, we need to switch, as Mark said, our hospital, what we call from a regular world to trenches, because we need to transform in 24 hours our hospital, um, most of them in the pulmonology department as only regular world beds, into, let's say, high dependency unit or critical care beds. So as the two Italian societies, we need to develop a sort of a very quick evidence, evidence, uh, we can call evidence, but we don't have much evidence, guidelines, how to manage with uh, these, pe these people. As I said to you before, if uh, uh, 6,500 people were not admitted to the hospital in Lombardia, we need to face what should we do for these patients. So we develop a very a uh, simple algorithm. I don't want to pass through all these algorithms, just to let you know that we were looking uh, at major uh, vitals like saturimetry, uh, respiratory rate, encephalopathy score, and we use also what uh, is called the news to score. And we were very happy. We wait between 30 minutes and two hours to try to decide where to admit this patient with acute respiratory failure. Well, this is the score that we use. The score is the new scoring system that is a very useful and clinical score, very easy to be recorded. And we were very quick in decide the best environment to our patient. I remind to you that in most of the cases, these patients were not treated in the either ICU, as I said before, but also respiratory wards. Most of these people were uh, uh, treated outside a protected environment and were treated by doctors and nurses that were not trained, for example, in administration of basic oxygen or uh, non-invasive ventilation of CPAP. These are rough numbers. Uh, they, I may have, I collect them uh, very quickly because it was very difficult to collect data from all the areas that I'm in charge with. However, it is uh, clear that about 10% of this 6,500 patients admitted in the first three weeks receive only standard oxygen, about 20% oxygen with the more sophisticated methods like Venturi, or a servoir mask, 19% high flow nasal cannula, and the majority of the patient, 32%, receive CPAP, and mostly CPAP with the helmet. Why with the helmet? Because we figured out that it was not only the easiest way to assess, uh, uh, to apply uh, a sort of non invasive support, but also probably the less dangerous for the personnel. 
and about 20% of these patients were also receiving NIV, most of the time in the uh, negative pressure rooms or in the uh, respiratory and critical care wards. However, we got around 25-30% of NIV application outside one of these two environments. Well, this is a slide on the left-hand side. This is a patient on NIV uh, in supine position, and on the right-hand side in the prone position. We started, this is the arterial analysis, I don't want to go into details, but just to show that this uh, patient was ventilated with a pressure of uh, uh, 12 over, over 8, with a BiPAP, a standard BiPAP machine, with a full face mask. Um, he was uh, here in the supine position, uh, PAO2 was 75, with FiO2 of 40% of that, of uh, oxygen, and as soon as we put the patient prone, you can gain a lot of uh, in terms of ventilation perfusion. And if you place the patient in the indelible position, you could even improve much better the gas exchange of this patient. Well, uh, we, uh, this is Crema. Crema is my hometown. It's a small town of 30,000 inhabitants, but was it since the beginning. And uh, uh, what the population, the normal people outside the hospital put after one week was this uh, uh, banner stating Medici di Infermieri Sete Nostro Dolio. That means, uh, doctor and nurses, you are our pride, thank you. Well, it's true, I think people, they recognize our effort, but I think, as Mark said, that the most important thing in my country was the safety of our personnel. And unfortunately, uh, we were not ready. And I think, uh, as uh, Mark said, Spain, got, uh, Spain and uh, uh, obviously France, and probably also Germany have time to prepare themselves and to prepare the personnel to better cope with this very contagious disease. Here is the, uh, the paper that we publish as a fast track uh, uh, based on the protection of healthcare workers. And this is by my last slide. Well, this slide is dedicated to Giuseppe in particular, that he was a pulmonologist that died in coma, lost in action on March 9, 2020. And to all the others, 113 doctors and 34 nurses that died of COVID in my country. These are the first people who died. Uh, uh, Giuseppe is the one on the right hand side in the middle, he was a very good friend of mine and I want to dedicate, as I said, this presentation to him and all to the other years that I in their duty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nava. Um, we'll move on to the next presentation uh, by Dr. Uh, Charles Powell. Uh, Dr. Paolo is a professor of medicine and systems division chief for pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. He also is the CEO of the Mount Sinai National Jewish Health Respiratory Institute. Dr. Paolo. I'm bringing up Dr. Powell's um, Presentation, one moment, please. 
we can see the slide. I think we can start, Dr. Pavel. Yeah, we can see the slide. But he, he is still muted. Okay, Dr. Powell is muted. Please unmute him. He should be unmuted now. Uh -huh. He got an unmute you. request. Please unmute Dr. Powell. Okay. Great. Apologize for the delay. First, I want to thank ATS and ERS for the opportunity to speak. And I want to also thank our colleagues in Europe, in Germany, in France, in Italy, and our colleagues in China, from whom we've learned so much as, we, as we've been confronting this pandemic in the United States, both in the state of Washington first and in New York City second. But like everything in New York, we do it big. And it's hit here, and it's hit here quite hard. And the initial challenges really were all about the volume. Can I have the next slide, please? So what I want to cover for us today is really at a high level how we attempted to compensate for the anticipated surge of patients that we expected to present to our hospitals in New York City, how we planned to make sure that we had enough staff, enough staff with adequate training and in the right place to care for all these patients, that we had enough equipment and then to take the learnings that were generated from the experience in Europe and in China so that we were able to learn more about the disease pathophysiology and appreciate this is not straightforward ARDS and to be able to alter our approach. And like everything that we've done in managing patients with COVID, the typical rules of engagement in healthcare have been suspended. We're doing things much faster in terms of staffing, in terms of regulatory approvals, in terms of clinical trials than we ever, ever did before. We're doing much faster in terms of making scientific discovery and getting, getting them published and disseminated so they can be used. And I'll, I hope to give you a few examples of how we've been able to apply that going forward. I'll give you a few learnings about disease pathophysiology from our perspective, and I think that overlaps what we heard before. And then if there's time, I think it would be important to talk about what we all expect to be the new normal. We can't expect to return to normal when this is over not until there's a vaccine or until there's widespread testing. It's going to be a new normal that's going to affect healthcare and other businesses as well, and hopefully we'll have time to discuss that. So, next slide, please. So we heard from Italy that cases seem to peak on March 18. We were just getting started around March 18. And here is the data in terms of daily hospitalizations in New York City. So it starts off with a little trickle in, in the early March, and then it peaked around last week. And I'll tell you, a week ago, we were in a much different position because we were working with projection of hospitalizations based upon number of infected patients, based upon a society that did not have any social distancing in New York two weeks ago, where we had projected hospitalized cases of over 20,000 in our health system alone. Big problem because at our peak, we can only accommodate 4,200 patients. So what happened over the last two weeks is that we've seen the impact of social distancing. The double time has gone up, and the number of hospitalized patients has come down by several thousand every day, such that we hit our peak at around 1,700 patients right now, and now we're hovering around 1,962 patients, 452 of whom are in the ICU. The next slide, please. That was the Mount Sinai data I gave you on top of the New York City data. On the next slide, I, I show you some interesting demographic characteristics that we also touched on. First, on the left-hand side, I show you the distribution in terms of cases of COVID in New York City, again, by age. And you can see that there's not much difference in terms of distribution of age once you're above 45 all the way to 75. And also, there's not very much difference if you look at the distribution of cases by gender. Yes, there are more men than women, but it's not very pronounced. But it's a different story if you focus just on those who are hospitalized on the right. And if you focus on those who are just hospitalized, you see that those who are younger have a much lower rate of hospitalization than those who are older. And, and for everybody here, we know the definition of older changes every year. 
from our perspective, but for this, this case, it's like 65 and older. And also the discrepancy between men and women also has, has increased. So we see gender is associated with increased hospitalization. Gender is also associated with increased risk of ICU hospitalization in our, in our setting and with death, as are other characteristics such as obesity and diabetes. And hypertension is kind of on the borderline, which suggests some phenotypic differences associated with some genetic abnormalities or a metabolic syndrome that may have a role in the disease pathophysiology that is quite relevant for us as we go on forward with our discussion here today. So I've mentioned up front, initially the challenge was volume. Before we knew that the peak was going to level off, we needed to make sure that we had enough personnel. We needed to make sure we had enough equipment. And the initial focus of equipment, especially through my lens, where I direct respiratory therapy amongst my other roles, was to make sure we had enough ventilators. So we spent the past several months purchasing ventilators from everywhere. And those we couldn't purchase, we rented. And so we added about 800 ventilators to our stockpile. So we had about 1,400 ventilators in our health system. But we weren't sure that was going to be enough. So around that time, we received a donation of 300 BiPAP devices, the ResMed VPAP ST devices from the Tesla Corporation. And the question came up, could we use these devices in the intensive care unit setting for patients who were endotracheally intubated? So we happen to have a really wonderful team of sleep physiologists with terrific expertise in these devices. In fact, David Rappaport invented the BiPAP device, and they were able to develop a circuit for us where we could connect the ResMed device, which is on the bottom left, to regular tubing that is available in every stock room in every hospital, added HEPA viral filters to prevent the expiration of the virus, and then also connected spirometers that could be connected to monitors that could be placed outside the room. And if for those institutions that had capability, the, mon the ventilators could be monitored from outside the room and remote controlled from outside the room. So we put this together and we were able to have this amount of, of extra ventilators available if we needed the capacity. We've peaked now and we don't need that capacity, but now we've made these ventilators available to other sites in New York State and around the country and they're available around the world. And the protocols that we developed and the training videos we developed are freely available on our website. So that's the equipment piece. Next is the staffing piece. So the director of our Critical Care Institute at Mount Sinai Health System is Rupa Kohli Sethi, who's done a very wonderful job of adopting the Society for Critical Care Medicine's tiered structure for manning intensive care units, whereby you have a single intensivist who is in command of up to four teams with physicians who may not have specific critical care training, but have access to an intensivist with intensive care training, and then teams underneath predominantly to function as eyes and hands and report upward as necessary. So then we have single intensivists then in charge of 40 to 50 ICU patients at a time. We're able to do that by increasing our ICU capacity by doubling up beds. Most of our rooms are double bedded right now in the ICU at Mount Sinai Hospital. We've increased our ICU capacity by over 50% and we're full to be able to accommodate all the patients at Mount Sinai Hospital, and this is the staffing structure that's been successful in manning that. So that's the volume part, but as important, now that we've, I think, successfully developed the capacity to deal with the volume and the surge, is being able to do what we do best, and that's to focus on the disease entity itself, both in terms of understanding it and in terms of bringing new treatments to our patients as we understand the disease better, whether it be by repurposing medicines for other indications or by clinical trials. And we're using both pathways at Mount Sinai. Next slide, please. First off, I think it's quite clear this is not run-of-the-mill ARDS. The lungs are not stiff, they're pretty darn compliant. And nor is it clear that the opacities we see on these x-rays, especially in the periphery, represent ARDS opacities as well there is a possibility that they may represent infarcts. I think we've all been learning over and over again now that there is a endovascular injury that predisposes patients to in situ thrombosis that can grow over time and develop into full-fledged pulmonary embolic disease as well. 
as well as emboli and thrombosis to other organs. And so a lot of our emphasis has been on understanding this pathway, understanding who's at high risk for this and adjusting our treatments accordingly. At the same time, we in our institution use hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, acknowledging the database is not particularly strong. All patients are screened with an EKG beforehand, and I can't say for sure whether it helps or not. We also have protocols in place for the use of steroids when they're indicated, but we do not use steroids and tocilizumab together. We've brought tocilizumab back now. It's being used up front in patients before they're critically ill, and that really aligns with our emphasis on bringing the targeted therapies to patients early on in the course of illness as we understand who's at high risk for progression and who is not, and the opportunities to prevent somebody from developing critical illness requiring mechanical ventilation are preeminent in our goals for our approach to our patients here. We have multiple clinical trials in place at Mount Sinai. We're using antivirals such as remdesivir. It's still a clinical trial here. We have several IL-6 blockers in active clinical trials. We have trials using autologous mesenchymal stem cell transfusions and convalescent plasma, which is a very Pop, it's a very highly used program right here at Mount Sinai. We have dozens of patients already treated with convalescent plasma. We just added a trial for GMCSF, and we, in the pipeline, have complement inhibitors. So I mentioned to you anticoagulation, how important that is, in our view, in high-risk patients. I will share with you our anticoagulation protocol that was formally approved and is available for sharing from the Mount Sinai Health System, and that's shown to you on the left. So here, we take patients and we try and identify who's at high risk and who's not. And I will be the first to acknowledge that the ability to distinguish who's at high risk for thrombotic complications versus those who are not, are not obvious. We look at D-dimer cutoffs, and the D-dimer cutoffs, I don't think, are firmly set. We look at trajectory of change of D-dimer. That's pretty helpful. And we look for markers of the inflammatory cascade being activated, whether it be high CRPs or high ferritin. And those parameters help us to distinguish those who may be at risk. We have anecdotal cases of patients who have been hospitalized here, came through, normal D-dimer, normal x-ray, go home, two days later, come back with a large pulmonary embolism. So we're humbled by this and acknowledging that we're not firmly entrenched in understanding exactly who's at risk. But those who seem to be at risk, we use systemic anticoagulation, typically with low molecular weight heparin. We've taken it one step further for patients who are critically ill with refractory hypotension and large dead space ventilation. Under the hypothesis that, that this is caused by in situ thrombosis in the lung, causing VQ mismatch, shunting, and endovascular injury, that combines both thrombotic processes with vasodilatation almost analogous to what can be seen in a patapulmonary syndrome. We were able to test that hypothesis in five extremely critically ill patients who all received low dose TPA with concomitant heparin. It was key that the patients receive concomitant continuing anticoagulation afterwards. So of those five patients, four survived. This case series has been submitted for publication. The one who didn't had a huge RV thrombus. But again, we don't consider this to be DVT to PE that can be laced with one administration of TPA. This is an ongoing process that requires ongoing coagulation in our view, and we have ongoing clinical trials being planned to extend this line of therapy so we can understand it better in a, in a, in a safe, controlled fashion. So I think that's my last slide. And of course, if there are any other questions or comments, we're happy to take them on uh, during the course of the webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Paolo, for your nice presentation and for sharing with us your view from, from the US. I think it's time to move to the presentation from Dr. Tobias Muerte, who is the director of the Department of Pulmonary and Infectious Disease at Hanover University in Germany and the past president of ERS. And let me add possibly 
one of the persons with the broadest knowledge in infections going from nasal congestion to ICU or lung transplantation. Professor Welker, please. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Eva. So we are a little bit run uh, uh, out of the time, and so I do it without slides. Uh, if, if you look to the situation in Germany, you will recognize that we have a lot of cases, about 130,000 up to today. It's different from Italy, it's different from France, so we have no hotspots. We have more patients in Bavaria and in Baden-Württemberg, which is the south. And the reason for this is that the uh, pandemic starts in Germany after people came back from uh, skiing in uh, northern Italy, in South Tyrol, and in Ischgl, which is in Austria, and which was one of the main spreads of uh, COVID. But altogether, it's a pandemic. Okay, so I, I chose, yeah, go to the third slide, yeah. Uh, um, altogether, it's all over Germany. It's a little bit less in the north, a little bit more in the south, but Germany is uh, affected uh, uh, in total. That is the WHO data from yesterday, 120,000 patients. But as you can see, uh, up to now, we have only two and a half thousand of deaths. So the death rate in Germany is 2.5%. And it's much, much less than it is in all other countries in Europe. Why is this the case? So in my mind, there are a number of reasons. First, Germany was prepared. We had the first cases in the beginning of January when a woman from China visited a company uh, in Germany and there had been an infection of altogether 12 uh, uh, company uh, um, members and this was solved by isolation so there was no spread uh, of the disease but this raised uh, an awareness for COVID. And when it started in Italy, uh, this was the starting signal for Germany to be prepared. What, what does it mean to pre be prepared? We changed our distribution of hospital beds. And we changed it in all hospitals over Germany. So we uh, created dedicated new intensive care beds, dedicated new infectious disease beds, uh, with a strict standard operation procedure for hygiene measurements, uh, diagnostic testing, and mainly isolation. And when COVID arrived second time in Germany, which was mid to end of February, we, we uh, finished this, we had finished this, and we were prepared. Second reason, Stefano mentioned it, Germany has the most intensive care uh, beds and the most hospital beds in Germany, and we do not have only the beds. Uh, we have the resources to drive these beds, which means ventilated, ventilators and equipment for this. The third point may sound a little bit strange, but it's very important. It's social aspects. If you look to Italy, and I know it very well because I uh, had a long time in Rome when I was young. It's, and it's the same in Spain, it's, a, let me say, a family country. So families are living together. Uh, a lot of young people are living together with their parents. And this is totally different in Germany. Germany has six times more uh, single households than Italy, meaning people living alone. In my mind, this is not good in normal life, but it's uh, very good in case of a pandemic because the likelihood to spread uh, the virus is much lower. And Germany has more than double of space 
per population uh, per, per everybody living in Germany, and this is also an, a protective issue. The third or fourth reason uh, what we did well in Germany is hygiene policy. We started a so-called uh, double face mask policy, which means every patient in the hospital wears a face mask and every uh, staff member which is in contact with patients wears a face mask. We are uh, focused on FFP1 masks. We only use FFP2 masks in a situation where aerosols uh, are induced, which means bronchoscopy, endoscopy, intubation, and in uh, ENO street, uh, in the ENO street department and the TS department. In all other departments, we used FFP1 masks and looking to the number of nosocomial infections with Corona SARS-2 virus, we did very well. This is very low in Germany. So, fifth point is diagnostic capacity. In Germany, we use PCR, so as most do, but we had a much higher PCR capacity from the beginning on, and this means we were able to diagnose more patients earlier in the course of the disease altogether. The diagnostic tests run are much more in Germany than in the other uh, countries in Europe. And so we could start isolation policy earlier. The last two points are with regard to treatment and uh, yeah, to treatment, and I totally agree with what Mark said. Uh, I'm only in favor of randomized controlled trials. If you look to the Chinese data published in the best papers in New England, JAMA, and whatever, they used five, six, seven, eight experimental drugs in every patient. And I think, how do you want to say which works? You cannot say this. And if you want, I, I know we are, we are all afraid seeing these patients on the ICU, but polymedication is not only maybe not beneficial, but it could be harmful. So in, in Germany, very early, we started randomized control trials. Um, and my department, for example, uh, we do anti-IL-6, uh, toxilizumab, um, we do remdesivir uh, at the moment uh, in, in our cities, and we do not much more. Um, there, there is a final comment, when to treat patients, which, what uh, uh, strategy. In the first part of COVID-19 disease, it's a Th1-driven lymphocytic disease which affects the endothelium. And the main pathology is breakdown of the uh, endothelial barrier. During this time, antivirals may make sense, and <laughs> anti-inflammatories which address lymphocytes. In the last phase of COVID disease, it's a classical RDS, which is an influx of neutrophils and the activation of macrophages, and then it's classical RDS treatment, which means from a pharmaceutical point of view, we use, for example, in inhaled GMCSF uh, um, um, uh, in, in a randomized control trial, or we, we use other techniques um, which are used for RDS. In terms of mechanical ventilation, prone position is the key factor of our management. So if patients are intubated, we, we start with low to middle peep, not more than 8 to 10 uh, millimeters of mercury of peep. 
but prone position in every patient. And when the, the patients improve and we let them in prone for 48 hours, when they improve, they go to the weaning process. And when they deteriorate after being turned back, uh, we move them back uh, to prone position. Nevertheless, mainly from patients coming from other hospitals, we have a lot of late RDS and then patients on um, uh, ECMO treatment. However, the prognosis for these patients is really bad. What is different in Germany, and I think it's the same uh, in France and maybe Italy, uh, the first Chinese papers reported uh, an intensive care unit mortality of about 90% when patients are on a ventilator. This is really not true for Germany. So our uh, uh, ventilation mortality at the moment is something between 20 and 30%, and this is typical uh, for RDS. So that's from my side, and I'm happy to get your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Welte. Um, uh, thanks a lot. And I think we can start a few minutes uh, to, to questions. As you might know, we have received plenty of questions from the audience. And we had to select just a few of them because of time issues, of course. And I will also ask the panelists to stay with us a few minutes more to give the opportunity uh, uh, to, to answer some of these questions. So the, the first question will be for Dr. Nava, please, as expert in ventilation. So what's the role of non-invasive ventilation in the management of respiratory failure in patients with COVID-19? Is there any risk for uh, intubation delay by using non-invasive ventilation, for example? Please, yeah, obviously, obviously uh, NIV. Can you hear it's me now, uh, Dr. Now? Okay. So, is there a role for yeah, NIV? Uh, yeah. can, can, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me or not? Okay. Yes. So, uh, Eva, definitely yeah, there is you. a role for NIV. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. You ask a quite important question. Is NIV delaying uh, the time to intubation? And I would say yes. Uh, this is hypoxic respiratory failure, so you have a high chance of failure. Uh, we reported, uh, according to our experience, around uh, 50, 45, 50% chance of failure, that is quite high. However, I want to come back to the previous point. The previous point is that when you are lacking critical care beds, you need to support your patient irrespective of the modes uh, of ventilation. Uh, if you, uh, after, uh, especially in Lombardia, after uh, three days, all the ICU beds were occupied, so you need to treat most of the patients with acute respiratory failure outside the ICU with NIV. Um, I, I think that my major concern is not just the delay, because we were quite fast in deciding. Uh, we gave them like between uh, six hours and eight hours to decide if we intubate the patient or not, because we could do that. Uh, but I think it is a matter of safety. Now, uh, the ideal place to ventilate a patient with NIV is negative pressure rooms. However, in our hospital that is 1,200 bed, we run out of negative pressure room 50 in uh, 48 hours. So we need to ventilate the patient all over. And the World Health Organization was very clear in stating that if you have an air uh, recharge of 160 liters per hour, that meaning open the windows and the doors, you can get quite safely 
get rid of the problem of aerosol droplets. And I remind to you that this is true not only for NIV, but is also true for oxygen. Uh, if you apply four or five liters of oxygen, you can spread the aerosol in a diameter, in a radius of around 60, 80 centimeters. So aerosol droplets is an important issue, so why you should protect yourself very well. Thank you, Dr. Now. Next question is to Dr. Paolo, and it's related to the first question. Uh, there are two schools that emerged. The one is early intubation, right, uh, versus delayed intubation, at least in the U.S. And um, are there any other strategies besides non-invasive ventilation, such as prone positioning, that could be used in patients with high oxygen requirements that are not mechanically ventilated? So prone positioning outside. Yeah, I agree. That's an important question because there was some in, in, in my mind, that no, early intubation was I, indicated I, I, for patients I'm, who had COVID-related respiratory failure. Can you hear me? So that, that was a school of thought. But uh, our, our position is that we can maintain patients yeah, yeah. who have COVID-associated respiratory failure with supplemental oxygen. We use high flow nasal cannula, but we really use low flow, high flow, if you will, because it's clear that as you increase the flow rates and the aerosol deposition rates increase. So we go up to about 25 comfortably. We tend to avoid using NIV with a face mask for the same reasons that we heard about before, risk of aerosolization, and we do not have access or, or use the helmet. We we're comfortable with the risk of aerosolization with these modalities based upon the prior literature, but that's not enough. Right now in our lab, we are delivering vial-sized particles to patients using low flow, high flow, high flow, high flow, medium flow, high flow, NIV, and we will be measuring exactly what the deposition of aerosol droplets is in a negative pressure environment, and we'll report that out as soon as we can. So. We have multiple cases, as I'm sure you all have, patients who can be successfully maintained and get better without being intubated. We monitor patients very carefully, of course, and if we cannot adequately oxygenate them with high flow nasal cannula or with 100% non rebreather, meaning the gas exchange deteriorates or they have unmitigated work of breathing, then we will intubate them, but we give them time. We give them time to declare themselves and to get better, and we've seen multiple examples of that, and we're, we're able to stave off intubation. Okay, so uh, to Dr. Umber, uh, you're muted, you know, it was mentioned by Dr. Powell of anticoagulation in the setting of uh, you know, COVID-19, this being a prothrombotic event. And I wonder whether you could comment on this since you're also interested in pulmonary hypertension. Did you hear, you hear the question, uh, Mark? Yeah, you can hear me well? Good. So, can you you, Dr. Robert? Yeah, yeah, very well, very well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I enjoyed Charles' uh, comments and I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, please yeah. go ahead. All right. So uh, it was it was really important to to emphasize it so much. Sorry. It was very important to emphasize the thrombotic risk. I, I think it. It's a major threat, yeah. Thrombosis is a major threat to these patients. In France, the very first patient who died, died of massive uh, thrombolytic disease with a massive PE. And for me, it was a, a real warning. And in my department right now, a large proportion of patients presented with COVID do have uh, thrombolytic disease at the time of initial presentation and during hospitalization. So with my group, and we work a lot on pulmonary embolism, 
we have put together a, a table which has been sent to all departments uh, in my hospital. And uh, clearly, we have some uh, risk factors, uh, BMI, uh, history of thrombolytic disease, uh, dimers, fi fibrinogen, and uh, the, the severity of the case. And depending on the that, on the on these details, we have always some kind of preventative or curative anticoagulation. And I, I'm very sure that a large number of cases died of pulmonary embolism, and we have to be aware of that. Thank you very much. I think that the other hot topics in terms of therapeutic options in this infection is regarding steroids. So this last question is for Dr. Tobias Velke, please. What's your opinion about the use of steroids to treat these patients? Well, well, if you look to what it has been published, uh, mainly from China and Italy, most of the patients got steroids. They got it at different time points, more in the beginning and more when uh, late RDS occurred. I, I'm not in favor of this, to be honored, because I think, yes, uh, there is mainly in the second phase of COVID-19, uh, a pro-inflammatory response. There is a wave of pro-inflammatory response but it's much better uh, to look to more specific anti-inflammatory drugs than steroids are. They are too broad. And um, yeah, anti-IL-6 in my mind is a, is a good option because it's very specific. Uh, the English use anti-IL-1, anakinra. I would only also find it uh, too too broad and uh, too much interactions uh, with, with other innate immune uh, pathways. Um, but there is a, a huge number of other anti-inflammatories coming up. And this is always better than using steroids. They are cheap, but the, the benefit-harm ratio is unpredictable. So. At the moment, it's, it's more um, used be because you want to do something, but for the future, and I'm sure Corona SARS-2 will not disappear, we should be much more specific. Thank you, Dr. Welte. It's clear there is a lot to discuss uh, still, but unfortunately we do not have enough time. We are 15 minutes out of time. So I, have, I think it's time to thank you, thank you all. I have to thank the speakers first to share their opinions and their suggestions with the rest of uh, people online today. I need to thank participants, those who are online today and those will be uh, seeing this webinar afterwards. And please, a quick reminder to all participants, complete the evaluation form so we can identify uh, future topics and continue improving this series. Uh, so thanks again to everybody, to my co-moderator. And I, will, I would like to invite, invite all of the tonight's participants to join us for future presentation of this webinar series. So. Uh, stay well, stay safe, healthy, and thanks for joining us. You will see uh, any, some questions and uh, answers in the future from tomorrow. Thank you very much.